Timeless Truths, a collection of classic sermons from Dr. Charles Stanley. Today's selection, recorded in 1997, God has a plan for you. One of the most frequently asked questions that I have to face among people is this. Can I really and truly know the will of God for my life? How will I know when God is speaking to me? How do I know, for example, where to put my kids in school? How do I know exactly who to marry? How do I know when to leave this job? How do I know if we're to buy this house? All those questions that people ask, and sometimes people would say, well, is God really interested in any of this at all? Is this just my imagination that God would have a personal interest in all of this? Yes, He is. God is interested in every single facet of our life. And that's what I want to talk about in this message today entitled, The Will of God. And this is the first part of a two-part series. And the title of this message is, The Will of God, God Has a Plan for You. And I want you to turn, if you will, to Hebrews chapter 10. I want us to read just a couple of verses of this 10th chapter. And the writer of Hebrews is writing to a group of people who are undergoing all kinds of difficult and hardship and pain and suffering and probably being a little discouraged. And so this is what he says. He says in verse 35, Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive, listen, you may receive what was promised. Now, I realize it's hard for some people to realize that God has a plan for their life. And oftentimes people will say, well, I believe He could have had a plan for my life years and years ago, but now I'm at this age or that age or whatever it might be, and surely God certainly could not have any plan for my life. But yes, He does, and I want us to see in this particular passage and throughout the Scriptures what He says about the fact that He has a personal will for your life and mine. When we talk about the will of God, we're talking about His moral, we're talking about His personal providential plan for creation, but we're also talking about His plan for your life and mine. And if you'll think about it, it's the very nature of God, the very character of God, that He would have a plan for our life. For example, when you think about how God responds and how He acts in situations and circumstances, He is certainly not simply a reactor. God is a planner. If you'll think about creation for a moment, God planned the creation. As you read the first two chapters of Genesis, it's very clear that God planned exactly what He would do from day to day. When you think about the nation of Israel, for example, God planned to raise up a nation of people through whom He would send the Messiah, through whom He would bless the entire world. God planned to call a man by the name of Abraham and make him the father of the whole nation of Israel. God planned to use that nation to impact the world and to spread the truth of the fact that there is only one God and His name is Jehovah. God planned the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and His death at the cross. God planned our redemption before He ever created the world. He says that Jesus Christ was the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. God planned the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ through the Virgin Mary. God planned to evangelize the world of that New Testament day through the Apostle Paul. God planned our resurrection. God has planned to take us home to be with Him in heaven. He has planned a place and prepared a place for us which He calls heaven. God is not simply a reactor or responder. God is a great planner. And as you and I look at the life of our Lord Jesus Christ and look, He says, I must needs go through Samaria. The Lord Jesus Christ was following the plan and the will and the purpose of the Father. He says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I only do those things which I see the Father do. So therefore, when we think about the Lord having a plan for our life, it's just in keeping, for example, the very nature of God that He plans. Therefore, God has a specific purpose and plan for your life. He did not birth you and dump you into humanity. He allowed you to be born with a plan and a purpose for your life. Now, with that in mind, what we might ask ourselves is this. When we think about God's, per God's plan and His perfect and His will, I want us to think about the categories in which we discuss now the will of God. And I want you to, uh, to listen carefully because I want to ask you to give me these back. There are two, listen, there are two general categories of the will of God. First of all, there is the category of God's moral will. The moral will of God relates to every single person. 
the moral will of God are those do's and don'ts that are so clearly given in Scripture. If you took a concordance and looked up all the verses that have to do with the will of God or God's will, what you're going to come up with is you're going to come up with two primary categories. And that first category is God's moral will. What do we mean by His moral will? For example, let's take uh, those do's and don'ts of Scripture. He says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. He says, Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not covet. There's some things that are very evident to us in Scripture. We don't have to ask God's will or to pray about whether to kill, whether to cheat, whether to lie, whether to commit adultery, whether to steal, or whether to have idolatry in our life. We don't have to pray about that. That is God's very clear moral will given to all humanity. So the moral will of God is the will of God that applies to every single one of us. Now, it's interesting to me once in a while, some people want to place in that category some things that do not belong there. But let's go, if you will, to 1 Thessalonians. Back to 1 Thessalonians. We'll just take one book of the Bible just to pick a few here. And look, if you will, in the fourth chapter of this 1 Thessalonians. And if you'll notice what he says beginning in verse 3, Paul says, writing to the, Thess to the Thessalonians, he says, for this is the will of God. This is part of God's moral will. What's the will of God? This is the will of God. What is that? But this is the will of God, your sanctification, that is, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God part of God's moral will. Well, let's move from something that you may feel like, well, that would certainly be a part of His moral will, but turn over to chapter 5 and look, if you will, at a very familiar verse that most of us know by heart. Look, if you will, in verse 18. He says, in everything, listen, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. The moral will of God is that will of God that encompasses every single person. It is, it is the will of God for everyone. No lying, stealing, cheating, adultery, murder, and so forth. It's the will of God for everyone that we give thanks in every single thing in the Lord Jesus Christ. He says that is indeed His will. So when we think about the moral will of God, uh, that's, what we are, that's what we are referring to here. Now, the second category is the personal will of God. Now, when we talk about, listen, when we talk about the will of, the personal will of God, there are three categories I want us to think about in God's personal will for our life. We said, first of all, there is the major category of God's moral will for all of us. Secondly, there is His personal will. But His personal will is related to each individual, design, listen, God's design for your life, His purpose, His plan for your life. Under his personal will, there are three categories I want you to jot down. Three categories under his personal will. The first of all is his intentional will. What do we mean by his intentional will? Simply this. What is it that God had in mind for you when you were born? What is it that he had in mind? That is, surely God certainly had a plan for your life and a purpose for your life. So therefore, because he had a plan for your life, he had chosen what spiritual gifts, what abilities, what a talents, your personality. God knew all about that and planned that. He, of course, allowed situations and circumstances to affect us in our life in such a way that would develop us and that would equip us and prepare us for what He wants us to do, every single one of us. And therefore, you can't put somebody in a category and say, well, anybody who's going to amount to anything ought to grow up this way or that way. No, God, listen, God can take us out of the most difficult circumstances, out of the best of circumstances. He can accomplish His purpose and His will in your life and my life. He is a sovereign God of this universe. He has an intentional will for all of us. What kind of vocation you're going to give, you're going to have in your life, who you're going to marry. God has a schedule for your life and mine. He has a span of life for us. He's given us a certain amount of time. He's given us certain skills and abilities and talents. We don't all have the same. Some people have absolutely amazing skills and abilities and talents. Some maybe not so much. And some people may think, well, I'm just a homemaker. I'm just this and I'm just that. In God's mind, there's no just anything. Every single person is valuable in the eyes of God. Every single person has some gift. Every single person, God has a purpose and a plan for your life. There's no such thing as an unimportant person on the face of this earth. Nobody, listen, nobody should look, be looked down upon because every single person Jesus Christ died for, that makes them extremely worthy in the eyes of God. 
Somebody says, well, God's called me to do something I can't do. No, he did not. He may call you to do something that you're afraid to do, that you are scared to death, that you feel like you just absolutely would make a failure and embarrass yourself or embarrass someone else. But you know what? He will never require of us to do anything that, listen, that we cannot do, that he will not do through us because, listen, he's always looking out for our best. His intentional will for you and me ultimately, listen, ultimately he says is to be conformed to his likeness. He says he predestined you and me to be conformed on the likeness of His Son. He predestined us to bring Him glory and honor and praise. God has a personal will for every single one of us, and it is our responsibility to find out what that will is, to get in His will. Somebody says, well, but look, I'm 60 years of age, just trusted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior last week. How in the world has God got a will for my life? That brings me to the second category, which is God's circumstantial will. What do I mean by God's circumstantial will? Simply this, that listen, all of us at times in our life make mistakes. All of us sin against God. All of us blow it. All of us mess it up. All of us lose opportunities. All of us disobey God at some point. All of us rebel against God in some fashion to some degree or the other. So when we're talking about God's circumstantial will, here's what we're talking about. We're talking about, let's say, for example, I used to teach in a Bible institute up in the mountains of North Carolina, and most of the pastors who were there in that school, many of them, God had called them very early in life. Some of them, when they were teenagers, early as 20s, they, did, they refused to obey God, rebelled against God. Now they were in their 40s and 50s, and they finally yielded to God and said, okay, God, the pressure is so much, can't handle it. I'm going to go and do what God wants me to do, so they start to the school. Well, what was God's intentional will? If he called them at 17, at 17 years of age, get busy getting prepared to serve God. Now they're 55 and 60 years of age. What does God do? Here's what God does. He puts the pieces of their life back together. He forgives them of their sin. Has he revoked his call? No, he does not. What does he do? He just chooses to work in their life in the light of the circumstances as they are now. Listen, God does not reject anyone who comes to him. There are people who mess up their life deadly. I mean, years and years go by in rebellion toward God, get on drugs or whatever it might be, and they, then they come to Jesus and you say, well, you mean to tell me that God has a will for my life? Yes, he does. What is his will? Well, his intentional will, you blew that one. Well, you say, well, does that mean I'm lost? No, it does not. Does it mean that God doesn't care? No, it does not. What does it mean? It means that God picks you up all the pieces. He has this amazing glue he calls grace, and you know what he does? He puts you back together. He, begin, he forgives you of your sin. He begins to work in your life, and he will begin to use you, make an impact through your life, accomplish, listen, accomplish his circumstantial will in your life, but at no point does God say, well, you blew it, put you on the shelf. That's the end of that. Uh, you waited too long, therefore I can't use you. God can use anybody who surrenders their will to him and obeys him, no matter what your age is, no matter what you've done, no matter what your past may be. Almighty God loves you, and whoever you are, listen, you are worthy, listen, you are worthy to be saved by the grace of God or he wouldn't have come. He came not because you were worthy of it in yourself, but because he sees you as a valuable vessel that can bring him glory. Listen, you can bring glory to God whether you're 16 or 106. You surrender your life to God. He's got a will for your life. He has a will for our life whether we're surrendered to it or not. He has a will for our life no matter what our age is, what our past has been. The circumstantial will of God, this is his grace saying, I'm going to take you where you are. You're forgiven of your sin. I'm going to remold and remake your life, and I'm going to use you because my grace knows no end. He says, where sin abounded, listen, grace did what? Much more abound. That is his circumstantial will. All right? Under the category of his personal will, what's the first category? God's intentional will. What's the second category? God's circumstantial will. And the third category is God's immediate will. Now, what do we mean by his immediate will? Simply this that every single day of our life, you and I make decisions. In fact, life is one continuous series of decisions after the other. For example, you and I wake up tomorrow morning. Most of us have some kind of a schedule that uh, we believe that God has given us some direction for. It. Oftentimes, that schedule changes. You, you make a decision here. You make a decision there. What are you doing? You are, listen, you are making those immediate decisions. And so, he says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He'll direct your path. Which path? Every single aspect of our life. Somebody says, well, I do, I do understand what you're saying, but I have a question. Can a person resist the will of God? 
if God has a plan for my life, can I resist that plan? How can you resist the plan of this omnipotent God who has all power and who has designed our life? Well, what does omnipotence mean? Omnip the omnipotence of God doesn't mean that God, listen, by His brute force, forces His way into our life. By God's omnipotence, it means that God has the ability, listen, He has the ability to accomplish His purpose, listen, without defeat. God ultimately will not be defeated. He will ultimately accomplish His purpose. So the issue is, can a person resist the will of God? Yes, we can. You say, well, how much free will do we have? a limited free will. God has not given anybody absolute free will. Only God has absolute free will. And so we do have, uh, we do have some sense of a free will. And so God will allow us, listen, He will allow us to make mistakes. He will allow us to sin. To sin. He will allow us to uh, be disobedient to Him. He will allow us to rebel against Him. He will allow us to resist His will if that's what we choose. Yes, you can resist the will of God. Well, the second question is this. The second question is, if we resist the will of God, will God put pressure on us to bring us back into His will, or will He just let us go? Will He bring pressure upon us to, to, to do His will? Yes, He will. Well, how much pressure will he, he put on us? As much as is necessary to bring about what He desires. There are times when God, no matter what we say, He's going to put pressure on us. For example, would you consider a whale ride in the bottom of the sea a little pressure? I think you would. If you read those chapters, the second chapter of Jonah, and you'll find he's talking about the seaweed all wrapped around his head, and he's struggling for life and crying out to God and repenting of sin. What, the real revival took place in the belly of that whale. Was that pressure? You better believe it was pressure. I believe there are times when God's put such pressure upon us or whether it, is to, whether it is to show us the consequence of disobedience or just simply the awesome awareness of what He is saying, what He is requiring, and that He's not going to let up, that we have to yield and say, yes, God, Your will be done, not mine. Now, so the question is, can we resist the will of God? Yes, we can. Will He put pressure on us at times? Yes, He will. But here's the third question. Can we resist the will of God without suffering the consequences of that of that, listen, of that resistance to His will, and the answer is no. You cannot resist the will of God without paying the price. Now, well, you say, what is that price? Depends upon what the resistance is. If we want to get the consequences taken care of quickly, then listen, when you and I rebel or when we resist the will of God, the best thing we can do is to repent immediately, ask God to forgive us for being prideful and arrogant, thinking that we know better than He does, ask Him to forgive us at that moment. Now listen, little pressure or no pressure. But when we choose and we resist the will of God and we say, I know that's what may be what the Bible says, but I'm going to do it anyway. I know that's what the Scripture teaches, but I'm going to disobey God. I know that's what you may think and what you may believe, what you may teach, but here's what I'm going to do. When Jonah said, I'm not going to Nineveh, I'm going, listen, I'm going, I'm going down to Tarshish. I, I'm, I'm going to buy myself a ticket. I'm heading the other direction. Were there consequences? Yes, they were. And I'll tell you, listen, every single moment he spent in the belly of a whale, listen, he would have wished before Almighty God, listen, that he had never, listen, he had never said no to God. Are there consequences? Yes, they are. Can you resist him? Yes, you can. Can you live outside the will of God? Yes, you can. But not without paying the price and the consequence of being outside the will of God. God created you for a specific purpose, and all of us will stand before Him one of these days. We'll give an account for the life that we've lived. We either discovered the will of God, got in it, and walked in it according to His will, or we stepped out of it, chose to rebel against Him, and live outside the will of God. Once in a while, somebody says, well, I know a lot of people living outside the will of God, and they seem to be getting along fine. Remember the warning of Proverbs, don't look at the wicked and make your judgments of how well they're doing. You don't know how many sleepless nights they have. They have no peace and contentment and joy and assurance and security in life. They're basing all of their life and all of their sense of, of whatever happiness they have on things they can get and things they can enjoy and things they can be pleased with in life. But what about the moment when they come to die? What about the dying moments of their life? What assurance do they have? None whatsoever. And that is a moment that's coming in every single person's life. How you live is the way you're going to die. 
You live outside of the will of God unless you're saved. Listen, you live outside the will of God. You die outside the will of God. And somebody says, can, can people ultimately resist the will of God? Every single person who dies without Christ is testimony that, yes, you can rebel and rebel and rebel and resist and resist and resist the will of God. And ultimately, God will give you over to that kind of resistance. It is a dangerous thing to hear the truth to know the truth, to believe the truth, and to resist the truth of Almighty God because you have some other agenda for your life other than His. What you say, when, listen, what you say when you resist His will and His agenda for your life is, I want to have it my way. I'm going to ignore God and have it my way. My friend, listen, believe me, hear me. He says, whatever a man or woman sows, that they're going to, they're going to reap. What they sow, more than they sow, later than they sow. It is impossible to live outside the will of God without suffering the consequences. Listen, the consequences, not because God hates you, not because God ceases to love you. That's the very nature of disobedience and rebellion. The very nature of disobedience and rebellion are the awesome consequences of the very nature of sin itself. It is a foolish thing. It is an insane thing to know that God loves you, that God sent His only begotten Son, that He will save you, cleanse you, make you somebody, equip you, live on the inside of you, has a personal agenda for your life, and ignore all of that, live your life as you please, and die without Christ. You better should never have been born. Have I told you the truth? I've told you the truth. Now, the second question is this. What are you going to do about the truth? Right now, every single one of us has probably thought about something. It may be a little something or something that God brought to our mind, and we've had to ask ourselves the question, Lord, am I in your will about that matter? Or he may have said to you, you know, you, you know you have resisted, rebelled against my will in this issue in your life. The question is, what are we going to do about it? And that's between you and God. Listen, life at its best, listen, life at its very, very, very best is discovering His will and walking in it. You cannot improve on living in the will of God. And my plea to you is, if you have never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're out of God's will. You say, well, I don't believe all that stuff. That, that's not even the issue. You're out of God's will. If you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, you're out of God's will. Never been baptized, out of God's will. Never belonged to a local fellowship, don't care, out of God's will. Never given the money to support the, the work of ministry around the world, out of God's will. No, so, so wrapped up in yourself, no time for God, out of God's will. The issue is, what do we do about being out of God's will? We confess it. We repent of it. We ask God to forgive us. And if you've never been saved, you tell him, Lord, I'm asking you to forgive me of my sins. I'm placing my trust in Jesus Christ and his death at Calvary, the payment of sin. I receive him as my personal Savior here and I. I want to be the person you want me to be. I surrender my life to you. If any of these other areas or other areas that I've not even mentioned, God says, I want you to, I, I, you, you, you're resisting my will here. Make a decision. Just say, God, from this moment on, I yield to you. I want your will. I'm walking in it, God, no matter what. And you know what he'll do? He will enable you to, listen, he will enable you at that moment to step right in the center of his will and begin to walk in that to his glory and listen to your much, much greater happiness than you've ever experienced. He has a plan, the will for your life. Let me mention one other thing that he has a plan about. He has a plan that one day that you and I will stand before him and give an account for our life. Part of that plan is that he's going to reward us for all the good things that he's been able to do through us and in us. The last part of that is we're going to have an eternal home in heaven where we will be serving and rejoicing and living in oneness with Him with absolute uninterrupted joy unspeakable. And the question is, do you want to miss that? I don't think so.